All right, now in 2 Kings chapter 5 here, we have the entire chapter is dedicated to the story of Naaman the Syrian. Naaman was the captain of the host, the story is saying that he was basically, he's like the general, he's, you know, he's the captain, he was in charge of the army for the king of Syria. And um, it says he was a mighty man of valor, he was a strong man, he was a good warrior, but he was a leper. And it, it also says that the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria through Naaman. So like the Lord literally was using Naaman to, to bring Syria deliverance. Now Syria was not, um, you know, it's not the children of Israel. That's, that's another land. But, um, but he still used them in this war and, and um, was using Naaman, the Syrian. And basically the way the story goes is that, you know, Syria had already brought away some people captive from Israel. And... Um, Naaman had um, had a servant, uh, uh, it says a maid, so like a younger girl, a younger woman from the children of Israel, a, a Hebrew woman, was serving in his household. So he had, because they had conquered Israel, you know, um, they had taken servants away. And she was basically like a, you know, a bond servant, a slave girl to, to the house of Naaman. And, um, you know, his wife had kept her. And this, this girl said to her mistress, she said, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria. And she's talking about Elisha. She said, For he would recover him of his leprosy. So they hear about this. The, you know, because this little girl, or this girl saying, I don't know how old she was. It says she was a maid. But, um. This, this girl, this young woman is saying that, you know, if Naaman was in, was in Israel, you know, if he went to the prophet, then he, the prophet's able to heal him. So the king gets wind of this. And because Naaman is, is a very valuable man to the king, you know, he's, he's leading the army, he's winning victories. And leprosy, obviously, is, is, a, is a really bad disease to have, and it's fatal. And, you know, they didn't know how to cure it. They didn't know how to deal with it. Basically, you just get quarantined, usually, when you're a leper. And, um, and it, was a, it was a really bad disease to have that, that, would, that would spread in your whole body. And um, so the king of Syria hears this, hears what this girl says, and he's like, okay, well... If this is true, hey, I want Naaman to go and get cured. I want this to happen. So what he does, the king sends, you know, a letter and he sends gold and silver and, um, and some changes of raiment. So he brings these gifts to the king of Israel and, and sends Naaman and is basically saying, you know, I heard that, that you guys are able to, to cleanse the leprosy. And he's asking them to do that. And the king of Israel hears this and he's just like, am I God? And he's basically thinking that the king of Syria is just picking a fight with him because he's asking something that's impossible. I mean, someone just came to you and is like, yeah, I just, I need you to cure this cancer. This, you know, it's like this brain eating cancer and like nobody knows how to cure it. And, um, or what, you know, whatever disease, you probably just give them apricot seeds and you'd be fine. But <laughs> let's just say, let's just say there's, you know, whatever, whatever disease, right? Some, some, some deathly disease, they bring them to you and say, okay, I, you know, I heard you can cure this and here's a bunch of money. I want you to cure this. And what he was thinking is that this is just a trap because as soon as I say, I can't do this, then he's going to get offended. And then, you know, basically he's going to use this as, a, as an excuse to come and start a war with us or whatever. That's what the king of Israel's thinking. So he rends his clothes. And in the Old Testament, you find that people, when they rend their clothes, they rip their garments that they're wearing. It's because they're, they're like, they're grieved, they're upset, they're in mourning. And, it, and it's a pretty big deal. So, you know, he's, he's really upset about this. He's thinking that, you know, he's going to, probably gonna have to deal with a war now or whatever so when Elisha hears about this he basically sends and says you know send him to me you know why do you rent your clothes send him to me that he'll know that there is a prophet in Israel and so the king does he sends him to him and um, this is all just in the way of introduction to the story just kind of giving a, a, a you know a, a recap of what we just read because basically then Naaman goes to Elisha. Elisha tells him to go wash in the, in the river and he goes and washes and he's healed. And, um, but what I want to dig into is this section here starting in verse number 9 when Naaman actually goes to Elisha. And we're going to see that, that Naaman's expectations were different than what actually happened. 
Naaman was going ex with one thing in his mind, expecting how is the man of God going to heal me. And he had already conjured up in his mind what's going to take place, what's going to happen here. And what happens is not at all what he was expecting. And then we see his reaction of how angry he gets at the response from Elisha. But let's, let's look back at this story now. Look at verse number 9. It says, So Naaman came with his horses and, his, and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. No, don't forget now, Naaman was an important man. I mean, he was the captain of the host. He is, he is not used to being treated like some you know second class citizen or whatever some lower class citizen because he has this great position of power he's been winning victories you know he's typically held in respect look how elisha um, deals with them it says in verse 10 and elisha sent a messenger unto him saying go and wash in jordan seven times and thy flesh shall come again to thee and thou shalt be clean so right away we see elisha himself didn't even go out to talk to him Elijah's in his house. He sends a servant out and just says, okay, yeah, just, just tell him to go, uh, go wash in the river. Seven times to be clean. Now, he was telling him the truth. The message was there. I mean, the message that he needed to hear in order for his physical salvation, in order for him to, for it to be cured of his leprosy, was spot on. That's exactly what he had to do. That's what Elisha told him to do. But Elisha didn't even come to the door for him. Look at verse number 11. It says, but Naaman was wroth. Wroth means he was full of wrath. He was angry. And went away and said, Behold, I thought, so here we see, this is what Naaman was thinking in his mind. I thought he will surely come out to me. So the first thing he was offended by, Elisha didn't even come out, right? He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. So he's kind of thinking, I'm going to see this big spectacle, right? Elisha's going to come out and he's going to call, oh, Lord God, come down and whap. And he's like, he's, it's like he's expecting a Pentecostal. Like he's thinking that, that Elisha's a Pentecostal preacher. He's expecting to get slapped in the forehead to be healed. He's going to fall down on the ground and all this stuff's going to happen. I mean, think, look what he says. He says he's going to strike his hand over the place, over, I assume over the place where he has leprosy and recover the leper. And this is what he's expecting. This is what Naaman thinks is going to happen. Who knows why he thinks that maybe he's seen other charlatans doing that like we have today. I mean, there's nothing new under the sun that we have these charlatans, these Pentecostals that, that walk around claiming that they could just heal people and they, they literally slap people on the forehead and they fall down and they claim all these healings when it's all just a hoax and it's all just a bunch of lies. Um, that was probably going on back then. I don't know. But, but he had, for whatever reason, he had this built up in his mind of how this event was going to take place. So when it doesn't happen the way that he thinks and some messenger just comes out and says, yeah, go wash in the river seven times and you'll be clean. Just go do that and just sends him away. He's angry. And look what his, his response is. Verse 12, he says, Art not Abana and Farpar, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. He's saying, you know, the river Jordan isn't even that great of a river. You know, these other rivers, aren't they much better, cleaner, fuller, whatever? You know, these, these rivers are better. Can't I just go wash myself in them and get clean? Why do I have to go to this stupid river Jordan? You know, I, this, is, this is what he's saying. And he went away, he says, in a rage. He is extremely angry at this point. I mean, he does not hear anything what he expected. He must think it's a joke. Elisha doesn't even come out to him. But look at what his servants say to him. It says in verse 13, And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, Wouldest thou not have done it? How much rather than when he saith to thee, wash and be clean? Then he went down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again, like unto the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. So his servants tried talking sense into him and say, look, you came all the way down here. You heard the word of, you know, heard the message of prophet. If he would have told you to do, you know, to jump through all these hoops and to do some great thing. And, you know, if he would have told you to go hike this mountain and go to the top and find this bush and get this, you know, and like do all these things. He's like, he would have done it. You know, obviously he wants to get rid of his leprosy. And they're saying, you know, you would have done just about anything to get rid of this deadly disease, to get rid of your leprosy. 
why not if he's just saying this is all you have to do is go wash Joe, why don't you just go wash why don't you just go do it you know there's trying to talk some sense and so he so he hears him he hearkens unto him he listens and he does it and he said and, and he goes and you know that takes a little bit of humility after being in such a rage to be able to to step back and say okay i'm gonna go and just and just do what he said and as soon as he does it he says it says his flesh was like the flesh of a little child. I mean, his flesh was restored completely and maybe even better than it would have been, right? I mean, like a little child is such, is such nice, soft flesh that his, you know, the leprosy was completely removed. And um, it's an amazing story. And what I want to focus about, there's two aspects of this story that, that I'm going to focus on. I'm going to bring up some other examples and try to apply this to us today. But there was an expectation is one thing. Naaman had an expectation going into this that was false. It was incorrect. It was not a proper expectation of how these events should play out and how God deals with people and, and how everything was going to go. He had an improper expectation and then his reaction. The reaction that he had was not an appropriate reaction after he sees what was not what was expected. And... Um, this is what we're going to dig into. Now, first, what I kind of want to do, though, before we go any further, um, because I've got a lot of other examples, but this story is such a great story. It's, it's, it's very symbolic also of salvation, of our personal, eternal salvation. All throughout the Bible, you'll see like healings, and especially in the book of Acts, we went over that quite a bit, where people will get healed, and it's so representative, and it's so symbolic of, of our, our own spiritual salvation. And sometimes people, before they get saved, they'll expect some big show or some big event or some big experience to happen to them upon salvation and, and, and talking to God and doing these things. They'll, they'll kind of build it up in their head. Not everybody, but you know, some people kind of build it up in their heads that they're going to have this moment and it's going to be like Paul on the road to Damascus, right? Where the light shines round about him and hears a voice speaking to him. And people kind of build up sometimes this, this thing in their minds that this is the event that needs to take place. And once this happens, then I'll know that I have salvation because I've spoken to God. And people are kind of waiting for these types of events. And, you know, for the vast majority of people, it's not going to happen. I mean, that thing with Paul happened to Paul, right? I mean, you don't see all of these accounts of all of this stuff happening. There are very limited people that the Bible records actually having these types of experiences, you know, with a spiritual being, with, you know, with Jesus Christ maybe coming down and talking to him or whatever, or even with angels. It doesn't happen all the time. It's not like it happens to every individual. So we, you know, we need to make sure we don't have that type of an expectation. But, um, then you hear, you know, a lot of times when people hear how really simple it is to get saved, they'll scoff at it because people also then have this other mentality, this expectation of saying, well, no, if I'm going to go to heaven, then I have to be good. I have to live according to law. You know, these other people that do these sins, they can't go into heaven. They're wicked people. They're bad people. I'm not a bad person. And they kind of have this built up in their mind that salvation can't be that easy. Because they have pride, really, is what it boils down to. They don't want to have to let go of their own works and their own accomplishments and their own good deeds to just say, no, Jesus did it all for me. So oftentimes, and you get this out in, in uh, soul winning, people will scoff at that and say, no, no, you, that's too easy. That means that people can just go out and do whatever they want and sin, and then they can still go to heaven? Well, that's what a free gift is. And that's what it means to have eternal life. Eternal means forever. So yes, that can happen. And, uh, and people don't like to hear that. And, and a lot of times, um, you know, they'll get angry about it. The, not only will they scoff at it, but sometimes they'll even get angry that you're going around and say, well, you shouldn't be going around and telling people that they can just get saved by believing in Jesus because then they're just going to go out and do whatever they want. And... Um, And they get angry in it, and it's not the, not the right thing to do. Now, um, all of that comes though, usually as a result of people just having a false expectation. The, the wrong um, 
what they think is going to happen in a given situation. And, um, you know, I, I, digging in now a little bit, we're going to get off of the, um, this story with Naaman. But, um, well, real quick with salvation, I mean, you notice that he had, he had leprosy, right? Again, a really a terrible disease. All he had to do was wash. That's it. I mean, and you think about our spiritual salvation is, is equated to taking a drink of water, walking through a door, eating a piece of bread. You know, all these things are just like nothing. And that's why I said, you know, if you would have told you to do some great thing, wouldn't you have done it? And that's why I feel like, like saying to these people at the door, you know, if I were to tell you that, you know, in order for your soul not to burn forever and ever and ever and ever and ever in hell and to be tortured and tormented, you had to go to church every week. You have to help people out. You have to pray to God. You have to read your Bible every day. You have to do all of these things. I mean, wouldn't you at least be trying to do that? If you knew, if you knew that that would save you, that that's what you had to do. If you knew, and whatever it is, I mean, just you have to do all of these things. If you knew that that would save you, wouldn't, I mean, wouldn't you at least try? Wouldn't you be going forth and trying to do that stuff? How much more when it's not that difficult, when it's not that hard, when the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Why don't you just do it and accept it and just put your faith in him? You're so willing to do all of these other works at least you claim to be. You claim to be willing to do all this stuff. Why is it so hard just to trust Him only? Just to trust Him completely. And, um, and that's the attitude that, you know, unfor unfortunately not a lot of people have, but they should. And um, it lines up perfectly with this story about Naaman. But moving on here, um, about expectations and having the wrong expectations, a lot of times having a, a, a wrong or incorrect expectation of how things are going to play out can lead to, to a person having doubt. Okay, and here's a great example of this, and it's understandably so, but we wanna, I want to kind of look at this so that we understand the importance of setting our expectations appropriately and biblically so that we, we could know what to expect. And obviously, you know, there's curveballs and things can happen along the way, but reasonably, and, and that we're not, so that we're not deceiving ourselves for one, and we're not just completely incorrect about what we can expect about things. And, and you know, one, one good example of this is, you know, my expectations for this church, okay? Having, if I have the wrong expectation, it can cause me to doubt, it can cause me to fear, it can cause me to question, it could cause me to, for my spirit to be, um, you know, brought down really low and, and to start doubting things. If I expected this church to shoot up like a weed, and just start having, I mean, just having these chairs filled and we're moved out of here in a couple months and we're just going to, you know, set the world on fire and people are just going to be, you know, lining up to get in the door to Word of Truth Baptist Church within the first six months. That would be an incorrect expectation to have. And if I had that expectation and then it's like, oh, we've got six people here. You can see where I would get discouraged. You can see where that would have a bad impact on me. Instead of having the proper expectation of saying, no, this church is going to be like a big oak tree. It's going to be solid. It's going to be unmovable. We're going to have roots that are dug down so deep into the earth that no one's going to be able to move this church. We're going to have people that are providing strength in a core of this church. And if that's what we're going to be, if we're going to be that type of a church, it's going to take some time. The seed just got planted. It's not going to spring up overnight and be this big, strong tree. No, it takes time for the roots to dig down. It takes time to grow and for the trunk to grow and to get bigger. All of these things take time. That's the expectation I have, and that's what I'm planning on for this church, and that's why we're doing things the way we're doing and trying to do everything according to Scripture and according to the way the Bible says. And hey, sometimes that means telling people things they don't want to hear, and sometimes that means they're never going to come back again. But you know what? We're going to do things the right way. And God's going to see that we're doing things this way, and He's going to bless it. And we're going to rely on Him to build the church. But if we didn't have the proper expectations, you can see how that can cause some doubts and it can cause us to, for our spirits to be you know, discouraged and that we can think that we failed 
And, and that's exactly where the devil wants you to be because he wants you to quit. He wants us to quit this church. He wants us to quit doing things for God. He wants you to get discouraged. And don't give him an extra advantage by having incorrect expectations about things. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 7. I should have you turned there before. Luke chapter 7, we're going to see this story of, um, of John the Baptist when he was in prison. Because John the Baptist, I mean, John the Baptist says, you know, of, of um, Jesus Christ said that among them, men that were born of women, there had not uh, risen a greater than John the Baptist. And I know I didn't quote that perfectly, but basically he was saying that, that John the Baptist was basically like the, ever, the greatest Christian to ever live um, uh, up to that point, for sure. Obviously not including himself. But um, John was a great man of God, mighty in the power, mighty in the spirit, mighty in the Holy Ghost, you know, from his mother's womb. A uh, great man of God, but he even had a moment of doubt. And look at verse number 19 of Luke 7. The Bible says, And John, calling unto him two of his disciples, sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? When the men were come unto him, they said, John, the ba John Baptist hath sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? And in that same hour he cured many of their infirmities and plagues, and of evil spirits. And unto them that were blind he gave sight. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached, and blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. And then he goes on to praise John the Baptist to all the rest of the people. Um, John has a moment of doubt. John's sitting in a prison. Right? And John, like so many other people, I think at the time, had a misconception, had a false expectation of what was going to happen when the Christ came, when Jesus Christ came. See, in the Old Testament, they had, this is what they had to go off of. They had the scripture to go off of. But see, one of the problems with the Old Testament, and apparently they didn't quite understand the prophecies completely because... There's mixing of, of prophecies of Jesus Christ's first coming and Jesus Christ's second coming. Now, it's a lot easier for us to be able to look back and say, oh yeah, this scripture is talking about the first coming of Jesus Christ. Oh yeah, this is talking about the first coming of Jesus Christ because it's already happened, because we have history, because we have the New Testament to help us understand these things. We have a lot more going for us as far as that understanding goes. They didn't have that. So a lot of, a lot of what people were thinking was that when Christ came, was that he was going to set up his kingdom then. They were thinking, you know, and I don't know for sure if, if that's exactly what John thought, but he was thinking something else was going to happen since he started to question, are you really Christ? You know, like, are, are you really the, the one that we're looking for? Is it really you? Now, before that, I mean, he said, Behold, we saw this in John chapter 1, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. He was confident. He kept pointing people to Jesus Christ, saying, There he is. It's the Christ, the Son of God, the Lamb of God. But now when he's in prison, he's sitting here, things aren't quite playing out the way that he, the way that he thinks that they should have played out and the way that he understood them to. So his expectation was, was, you know, wasn't met. So now he's starting to doubt a little bit and starting to question. Um, and we can see how that happens when you, know, when you have an expectation and it doesn't quite get met. You start to question. Things. There's nothing wrong with questioning things. But don't let that, how you deal with that, how to, you know, don't let that get you down. Don't let that get you discouraged. Don't let that get you depressed and out of the fight. You might have to reanalyze things. You might have to rethink things. And you know, Jesus tells them, he says, look, Tell them all the things that you saw. Tell them about the deaf, you know, hearing again. Tell them about the people being healed. He'll understand. He'll know once he, you know, once they just say, "Hey, he's doing all these miracles," that it's gonna, you know, reconfirm that yes, he is the Christ. He's fulfilling all this prophecy. He's doing this stuff. It's obviously him. But things just weren't quite playing out the way that he had thought that they should. Now. Um, this is also a common this is also common when people have a false expectation that if a person is saved that they're immediately going to just clean up their life. And this is something that we see all the time too. Like people have this false notion that oh well you're a new creature all things have become new and they expect people to just just overnight like 
if they were drinking, they're not going to drink anymore. If they're doing, you know, whatever they were doing that's wrong and is a sin, hey, well, you're saved, so you're not going to be doing those things anymore because you're a new creature, and that's false. And that's a false expectation to lay up for people, too. Now, do we try to get, you know, people who are saved, try to get them in church, try to get them to learn? Of course we do. But they start off as a baby. They start off as a spiritual infant. We want to try to get them to grow, but they're not going to change overnight and they still have their flesh and they still have free will. And if they choose to live a life of sin, hey, they can still do that. And there doesn't mean that they're not saved. But people have this false notion of, uh, of, of, what, it, of what salvation even is and what's going to happen after salvation. Now, we also see in, um, you're in Luke chapter 7 still, right? We're going to jump down to verse 36 because the Pharisees also had lots of incorrect expectations. And most of that is because they taught for doctrines the commandment of men. They, they, weren't, they weren't saved. They, didn't, you know, they were trying to follow the law. They were trying to understand the Bible, but they couldn't do it. And they had a lot of incorrect expectations of what they thought. Let's uh, jump down to verse 36 there in Luke chapter 7. We're going to read this story here of when Jesus was sitting down and meeting with one of the Pharisees. It says, And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. Now we see here right away that this Pharisee has this expectation in his mind of what a prophet should be and what a prophet would do. And he starts doubting that Jesus is even a prophet at all because he has this sinner you know, washing his feet and, and, and you know, wiping the feet with his, with his hair. And, and, he, and he completely overlooks what she's doing in the humility and how she's, she's, you know, treating Jesus Christ. And all he sees is just some, some dirty sinner. Like, I can't believe that you're touching me. And that's where his attitude was wrong. But he had this expectation that, oh, well, if he's a prophet, he's not going to allow this woman to touch him. But look how Jesus answers him. He rebukes him. In verse number 40, it says, And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. Now, it's funny because <laughs> in his mind, he's saying this man, if he were a prophet, would have known this. In his mind, in his heart, He's not thinking Jesus is a prophet. But as soon as Jesus talks to him, he says, Master, say on. So he's, he's given lip service calling him master. When in his heart, that's not what he thinks. He was just thinking, hey, if this guy's a prophet, he wouldn't let him do that. Um, let's keep reading. Look at verse number 41. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. He said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. It's a wrong expectation. They, they didn't understand what a prophet truly should be. They, you know, people condemn Jesus for sitting with the publicans and with the sinners and talking to them and having meals with them and because they didn't understand. They think that he's above everyone so he shouldn't have to talk to anyone. But no, the whole point of him coming, Jesus didn't come to be ministered unto. He came to minister. He came to, for, uh, for a lot of reasons, but he came, he gave us an example of how we should be. 
You should not be lifted up in pride and think that you're so much better than other people and that they're there just to serve you and that, oh, I can't believe this person touched me. You bump up against some homeless person on, on the subway or whatever and, oh, I can't believe they touched me. That's not the right attitude to have. You're not so much better than that person. Don't allow yourself to have that type of a mind. It's a wrong expectation. Now, in, uh, turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 10. See, a lot of people these days have, a, have an incorrect expectation of what Jesus is like. They expect some, some long-haired, hippie, pacifist of a Jesus because that's what's been shown to them in the movies. Because nobody wants to actually pick up this book and read it for themselves. They just want to see it on the TV screen. And they want to see what some sodomite depicts him as and they say, oh, well, I see these old paintings by a sodomite. That must be what Jesus looks like because he's got long hair. No, the Bible says, doth not even nature itself teach you that it is a shame for a man to have long hair? Why don't you try reading the Bible sometime and you'll see that. Jesus Christ did not have long hair. Jesus Christ was not a shame. He did not shame his head. He did not dishonor his head as I just preached about uh, last week. But look, are you in Matthew chapter 10? Jump down to verse 34. Because he also wasn't just a pacifist. Now, did he minister unto others? Yes. Was he here to try to basically save the world? Yes. He came to, to uh, offer up himself as a sacrifice to pay for the sins of the whole world. Yes, he did that. But he did not just come to bring total peace on earth. Look what it says on verse 30, 34 of Matthew 10. He says, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Jesus is not all about just total unity and peace with everybody no matter what. Jesus is not just tolerate everything. Jesus is intolerant. You know what Jesus is intolerant for? Sin and wickedness. He came and he had to pay the price for it. Do you think he wants you just going out and committing all this sin? He's the one that bore it on the cross. He's the one that paid for it in hell. Do you think he appreciates it when people just go out and trample the Son of God underfoot as if it's a light thing? He didn't come to just say, oh, coexist. Oh, just love each other and love everything and tolerate the queers and tolerate the, the wickedness and tolerate the adultery and tolerate all this stuff. No, he brought a sword. And that's why sometimes a son is divided against his father because one of them might believe on Jesus Christ and the other one doesn't. And hey, that's going to cause division. When you have people that believe and they hold to God's word and they hold to the truth and they're being children of light, hey, when you go into the darkness, there's going to be division happening there. You have darkness of this world and you have the light of the scripture and you have the light of the Holy Spirit inside of you. There's going to be some dividing. And you know what? Not everyone's going to want to come into that light. It has to be divided because they're going to be scurrying off like cockroaches back into the darkness. People have this false expectation that they're going to be able to live their wicked, sinful lives and just do whatever comes into their heart, whatever desires they want. And then when they come into a time of need or trouble, then they're just going to turn to God and say, you know, and expect him just to answer him immediately and just, oh, OK, here you go. Oh, I'm so, thank you so much for talking to me now. You haven't prayed to me. You haven't gone to church. You haven't done anything. You haven't opened up the Bible. Yet now, you know, after you've lived your riotous life, now you want to come to me. God doesn't work that way. Now look, if you need to be saved wherever you're at, pray, call on God to get saved. He'll, he'll save you. He'll do it. If you need to put your faith in Christ and you've lived a wicked life or whatever, call on Him and He'll do it. But don't have this expectation, especially if you're saved, that, that God's just going to jump in and just do whatever it is that you're asking Him to do when you haven't done or lived or listened to Him at all. Now, depending on the circumstance, maybe He'll show mercy unto you and maybe He will listen. But don't have that expectation. It's a wrong expectation to have. You should not expect that. 
But while we're on that, that notion of prayer, we do, <laughs> we, we should expect when we do pray that we will receive the things that we pray for. And um, it's funny because it's, it's, it's not a contradiction at all. But um, it, turn, if you would, to Mark chapter 11. I just want you to see this real quick. And, and I've preached this before on prayers about, about sermons about prayer. Prayers about sermons. I, I've preached on this on, on sermons about prayer where, um, you know, when you start studying the Bible and you go in depth, God's going to do things. Basically, I'll boil it down in this illustration. With your children, you know, the more they listen to you and obey you and, and, and do the things that you want them to do, the more you're going to bless them, the more you're going to hear what they have to say. You know, Daddy, can I have an ice cream cone? Look, I was good all week. I did all this stuff. I helped Mom clean the house. I did all these things. I'm going to be a lot more likely to, to answer their, their request and, and to give them what they want when they're doing all those things as opposed to when you didn't listen to a word I said ever. You think I'm going to, you know, answer your prayer? Because your, prayer is just asking for something. You think I'm going to give you what you're asking for, you know, when, when you've been disobeying and been rebellious to me all week? Um, and basically, that's how God deals with us as children. It's the same way. So when you go off and just live this life, don't expect God then to just, you know, just hearken to you and, and do whatever it is that you're asking him to do. But on the other side, if you are doing what's right, if you're living a, a godly life and, you know, and, and you're, you know, you're getting sin out of your life and you're walking the right, right way and you're going out and winning souls and you're, you know, and, and you're kind of dedicating your life to God and you're serving him, you're, you're being the best child that you can. The Bible says that when you pray that you should believe that you're going to receive those things. You're in Mark 11, look at verse number 22. The Bible says, And Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, What things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them and ye shall have them. When you're walking right, when you're doing right, it is not an improper expectation to believe that you will have the things that you're praying for. If you're praying according to God's will, if you're praying the right things, if you're, pray, if you're doing what's right in your life, hey, you, and you ought to have that expectation. Don't lower your expectation on this when we have it clear from the Bible saying that, you know, what things whatever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. He says, you're going to have them. I'll give them to you. Believe it. That's a good expectation. That's a great expectation to have. And... Um, that can help us not to get discouraged when we know that these promises are in the Bible. See, God's promises are great because when you see something that clear and that's spelled out for us in the Bible, we know where the expectation is. It's already been set. The bar has been set. That's where we can set it and, and just and be confident of it. It was interesting. I was out soul winning. Um, when was that? I think it was on Wednesday. And, I th you know, going back to people having these, these, you know, incorrect expectations of things, he wasn't saved at all. But um, he was like a, you know, a, a thinker, a logical thinker, a philosopher type, you know, someone who's, I don't remember if you say he's agnostic or what he said. Um, he didn't have a good label for himself. But he, basically, he was thinking that, you know, he would expect God to look at his honesty and his sincerity because he says he's seeking the truth and he wants to know the truth and all this other stuff and he's on this journey and God's given us all these things to use our minds and and our reasoning and all these other things and he says that when he dies a just God will look at him and see that well you know, he was really interested in just knowing what the truth is and and you know I made him that way so you know, because he's got this, you know, this quest for knowledge and for knowing the truth, then I'll allow him into heaven. And that's what his expectation is. And I told him he was wrong. I mean, I told him that, no, actually, you're a sinner. And because you've broken God's law, there's a penalty to pay for that. And 
no matter how much you think you're interested in the truth, the truth is here, and I didn't say all these words necessarily verbatim, but you know, the truth is being preached unto you, and this is, um, you're going to end up going to hell because you've already broken God's commandments. No matter how much you think you're, you're sincere in your desire to know the truth, which I don't doubt him, he probably is sincere. He's sincerely wrong, he's sincerely incorrect, but it's not your sincerity that's going to get you into heaven. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that gets you to heaven. That's what the Bible says. That's what God said is the only way that we could get into heaven. It has nothing to do with your sincerity. Hey, there's a lot of sincere Muslims out there. There's a lot of sincere Buddhists out there. There's a lot of sincere Hindus out there. There's a lot of sincere fill-in-the-blank people in general. I'm sure there's a lot of sincere atheists out there. Their sincerity isn't going to get them any respect with God. He's going to look at all of them and say, you've all sinned and you all come short of the glory of God. You need a Savior. And that Savior has been preached unto you and you didn't receive it. You're going to go to hell when you die. And, um, you know, it's unfortunate, but people have these false expectations of who God even is. And a lot of them don't even think that, you know, a loving God wouldn't even have a hell or whatever. It's false expectations. is based on lies. Some people, there's other people out there believe that they're going to be saved based on their genealogy, right? I mean, some Jewish people believe that just because they were physically born of Abraham, however many thousands of years ago, they think that they're in that genealogy line that, that gets them a free ticket into heaven. The Bible says in Matthew uh, 3, 9, and think, you know, John the Baptist said, and think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Your, your genealogy means nothing. Your physical seed means nothing. <laughs> Another false expectation that people have is that Jesus Christ can come back at any moment. I touched on this this morning. And just swoop them way up out of any troubles that's going to happen. Before any persecution happens, before any tribulation happens. Now, I'm going to give you some, some Bible, some scripture to say that that's not the case. I'm not going to get into this very much at all, but i got three verses here for people who think that, that they're just going to be sucked up out of here before the tribulation really happens. John 16, 33 says, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. He didn't say, I'm going to pull you out of tribulation. He says, I've over he says you shall have tribulation. I have overcome the world. Acts 14.22 says, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. That one's even closer to, to, the, to the rapture. Entering into the kingdom of God, he says, hey, you must go through much tribulation to enter into that kingdom of God. And then uh, 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now, whether we're talking about the rapture or not, some people think that, oh, well, the Christian life is going to be easy because I'm doing what's right and God's going to protect me and I'm not going to come through any hard times at all because I'm saved and I'm a child of God. That is a false expectation to have. Whether we're talking about the rapture and the great tribulation or not, because the Bible says here that all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It's going to come your way. If you're doing what's right, I mean, you're saved, you're a child of God, yes. But especially if you're doing what's right, if you're living what's right, hey, you're going to suffer persecution. It's going to happen. Don't have this false expectation thinking that nothing bad will happen to you because you're doing right. And then people will, will um, start doing right. The persecution comes. And because they have persecution, they say, oh, well, this must not be right. Because they have a false expectation. And then a lot of times, and, and literally, you might think that's silly, but a lot of people think this way. They judge their actions based on immediate consequences. So they'll think that, you know, let's just say, for example, someone started coming to church here. And they start listening and learning and say, oh man, this is, this is right. You know, this is, this is right on. I'm hearing God's word preach. This is right. And then things start going bad for them on the job. And then people and family life starts going bad. You know, and they start having all these problems. A lot of times what people think is, well, maybe I was wrong about that church. 
maybe that church isn't right because all these bad things are happening to me. Everything was going fine before I started going there, and now things aren't going well. That false expectation, that false belief of what's going to happen as a Christian, you know, you think that all, everything's just going to come together. It's not necessarily true. We need to understand that, hey, if you're going to live godly in Christ Jesus, you, will, you shall suffer persecution. It's going to happen. And having those false expectations is what leads people into making poor decisions. It can lead people to get out of church. It can lead people to, you know, to get angry and, and to get upset and to give up and to quit when they shouldn't do those things. There's so many expectations that people have. You know, I'm not going to go into very many more examples. We're almost done. You know, everybody's got their expectations on how a church service should be, on how the music should be, on how the, the, the expectations of the pastor. Does he talk to me? Is he there just every second of the day to answer my phone call? Is it, you know, whatever. Is the expectations of the size of the church. The church is too big. The church is too small. This church isn't growing. We want to get out of here. It's too little. Whatever. Expectations of the church being in a fancy building. I mean, some people expect a church to just be another building. They don't see it as the people. They just see it as, oh, well, this church is meeting in a house. That's weird. I'm not going to go there. Because they just expect a church to be meeting in some completely separate building that nobody lives in. Now, our expectations ought to be based on the truths that we find from God's Word and not necessarily just from the world around us, not just from, from doctrines or commandments of men. We ought to try to get our expectations in line and right with the Bible um, to the best of our ability. And now our reaction you know, too many times people have a, a false expectation of God or of church or of the Christian life. And when things don't turn out, as I was just mentioned, the way that they should, they get mad, they quit. They kind of get that, that reaction that Naaman had at first. When he hears what he's supposed to do, he hears the truth, he hears how easy it is, but, but he didn't like the fact that, that Elisha didn't come out to him. He didn't like that, that things didn't play out the way that he expected them to. So he gets mad and angry and full of wrath and he leaves in a rage. That is obviously the incorrect reaction that we ought to have when our expectations fail. Because let's face it, you know, we're not perfect. Sometimes we're going to have expectations about things and they're going to fail. They're not going to come to pass the way that we think in our mind. We, you know, we get into, uh, especially, you know, you get into a marriage and you think, hey man, this is the way things are going to work out. We're doing things this way and this is going to work out this way. And that doesn't always happen, right? But how do you deal with that? is critical. How do you deal with that, with the, with the lapse in the, in the expectation, the expectation not happening the way that you expect it to? Now, um, I know personally, you know, how many times I've tried to set something up, like, like maybe I want to make a surprise for my wife, and I want to do something, and, you know, buy a gift, or whatever it may be, and you've got this, this whole thing planned out. So, like, I'm going to get home. And, you know, in, your, in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm going to get home from work, and she's going to be, like, doing whatever, like, exactly, like, she's going to be in the kitchen, or she's going to be doing this. And, and then, you know, I'm going to start this conversation, and I'm going to say this, and she's going to say that, and I'm, you know, and I'm going to make this all be smooth, and it's all going to work out. And then you come home, and, like, Kids are crying and things are broken and you start arguing right away and it's like, man, this isn't exact. This isn't what I was thinking at all. And then you start getting more and more frustrated because your whole plan and how you wanted things to turn out just didn't work out the way you wanted to at all. Now everything's ruined. Now I'm just going to throw my hands up and give up. It's a natural reaction to have, but, but we need to try to stop because it's not the right reaction. You know, you, I'm not saying I can't understand. I, believe me, I sympathize. I understand. It happens to me. But we need to, to try not to let that anger become the, the, the response to, to our expectations not being met. We need to be able to, to, to deal with the situation appropriately. And um, giving up is not the appropriate response. You know, getting angry is not the appropriate response. We need to be able to just adapt and to learn and to keep moving forward, or whatever the situation may be. You know, that's not a very you know, major 
event that happens when you try to do something nice and then all you know things just crumble and fall apart but um, I just use that to, to as an illustration that probably everyone can relate to um, <clears throat> but especially with the more important things expectations on the job expectations in your marriage and your life um, you know don't allow yourself to try not to allow yourself try to try to recognize in advance as early as possible things aren't going the way that I expected them to and I think even being conscious of that even just knowing that can help you start to think wait what happened you know remember what happened in the name this 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 could be really easy actually there's, there's there's usually an easy way out we could we can modify it by plan we can modify the expectation we could change things and and just turn this around and still make it good instead of just getting angry and start going the wrong direction and just getting in a rage and then being clouded because having that anger and that rage can cloud your judgment and you, it, it could it cause you when you start getting too emotional about things if you allow that emotion to take over, you'll start saying things and doing things that you really don't want to do, that, that really go against better judgment because you, you know, you're not being temperate. And this, this goes hand in hand with being temperate. You know, when, when um, your expectations are fail, fail for some reason, even if it's no, no fault of your own, just outside circumstances, things happen, cause your expectations to fail, you need to be able to, to recognize that, stay temperate, and move forward and not quit. So whatever the case may be, you know, I mean, his, his servant name and servants were able to say to him, hey, this is, this is actually a pretty easy thing. Why are you getting all upset about it? Hey, if this cleanses your leprosy, let's just do it. I know there's no reason to get all upset and angry about it. I know it's not what you expected to happen, but wouldn't it be great if it, if it works anyways? And it did. And then he was super thankful. You see, he comes back and he's like, you know, take this silver and these clothing. He's like, you know, take these gifts. And Elijah's just like, no. And he's like, I see now as there is no other God in all the world, but, but in Israel, he's, you know, like, like I'm going to worship the God. And then he asked for some earth because he wanted to build an altar. He's like, I am not going to offer sacrifices. I am not going to serve any other gods. You know, can you give me some earth so that I could build an altar so that I could just, my burnt offerings and sacrifices could go to the Lord? And, um, and then he asks, like, you know, look, when I go in with the king, he's going to expect me to go into the house of his God. And he's, you know, I'm holding up his hand when we go in there. He's like, I'm going to have to bow my knee. And that guy's like, he's like, forgive me for that. And um, obviously, I don't think that's right. But Elisha just says, okay, you know, go in peace, right? Just, just go. But, um, but we saw the change of attitude then. After his, um, after his washing and, he, and then he sees what happens and um, at that point then when he, when he goes through the process in obeying the commandment of the Lord I think his expectations were exceeded. I mean his, his skin became like baby. I mean you got to figure in his mind you know no one's getting, cle getting cleansed from leprosy. It's not a disease that like Oh, did you hear so-and-so got cured? Oh, did you hear so-and-so got cured? You know, like, that's, that's this common thing. It's not. So when he's going down there, he's got to be pretty skeptical. I would imagine you, you never hear of anyone getting cleansed from their leprosy. <clears throat> but him going down there, he's probably thinking, okay, it's worth a shot. You know, I don't want to be a leper. This is worth a shot. I'll try this. And... Um, and when he was clean and, and his flesh was like baby skin, like the flesh of a child, that's, that, that, that must have exceeded his expectations. And, um, and it all came through his obedience to God's word. Listening to the prophet, listening to Elisha when, when he had the power of God and was speaking God's word. And, and he obeyed, humbled himself. He had to humble himself. He was mad at first. He was a little bit too proud at first, but after he humbled himself and actually did what he was commanded to do, that's when, when he got the blessing and that's when he got the expectation. But um, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity to preach. God, I pray that you please help us to have realistic expectations that are based on the Bible. 
God, I pray that you would please help us to just have the understanding that we need to read your word enough not to have these, these expectations that Hollywood tries to pump into us, dear Lord, not to have just false expectations in general, dear Lord, for, from whatever source they come from, but that we would, we would have the truth from your word that we, could, that we could rely on, that we know we could rely on your word, and um, have proper expectations to, to try to limit our discouragements that we have. And Lord, you know, when things don't go as, as we plan them to, as we would expect them to, dear God, I pray that you would please help us to deal with that appropriately. Try to help, help us to have temperance and, and control our emotions and not just to get angry and, and in a rage and full of wrath, dear Lord, but help us to be able to, to assess the situation and to be able to, um, to move forward and not to let us get discouraged or to get down and to end up quitting on you, dear Lord. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.